the 10 Second Edition News, brought to you by Mobile. This is the 10 Second Edition News with Anne Fulham. Tonight, the Liberals ask Australians what they want, but will the party listen? A legal setback for football, player recruitment in doubt, and after the coup, a stroll through the garden of hardline ghosts. Good evening. A look at the Soviet Union's crumbling past later, but today was the start of a new era. And the first act of the new interim government, officially recognising the independence of the Baltic Republics. The decision of the State Council, led by Mikhail Gorbachev, ends more than 50 years of Soviet domination of the Baltic Republics. Gorbachev and the representatives of 10 republics passed a resolution freeing the Baltic states from 51 years of communist rule. Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania were annexed by the Soviet Union in 1940 in a secret deal between Hitler and Stalin. The Baltics were the first Soviet republics to declare independence. At times the confrontation with the Kremlin appeared close to warfare and Soviet officials threatened to use the military to keep the Baltics within the Soviet Union. But in the past three weeks, as the Soviet Union unraveled following the failed coup, Western nations began recognizing Baltic independence. In Lithuania, border posts and other sensitive state functions were already being handed over to local authorities. Vitautas Landsbergis, the president of Lithuania, said the resolution was welcome news, not just to the Baltic, but the entire international community. The U.S. Secretary of State James Baker will be traveling to the Baltics perhaps next week, and certainly they will be discussing economic aid, direct aid to the Baltics, to help them cement their newfound independence. The names of two Adelaide pensioners charged with war crimes remain suppressed pending an appeal. A magistrate lifted the suppression order today, but the two men are appealing to the Supreme Court. They face charges relating to the murders of more than 200 Jews in the Ukraine in World War II. The Federal Coalition's consumption tax campaign rolls on, despite growing evidence of voter doubts and party concern. Some of the disquiets surfaced in a Liberal Party survey and at the National Party Federal Conference. The royal anthem came after the singing of Advance Australia Fair. The Nationals are decidedly monarchists, but their own federal president admits they're not so chuffed about supporting this new fangled goods and services tax. There has been, understandably, considerable concern within our party and the wider community the, the tax itself will be debated tomorrow. Party leader Tim Fisher admits he's under pressure. They want a hurry up of the detail in relation to GST. That's not unreasonable. To help calm the troops, Mr Fisher says the Prices Surveillance Authority will be specifically tasked to make sure supermarkets and businesses pass on to consumers the huge reduction in their indirect taxes that will come with the new GST. The Liberals too have discovered only a limited support for the goods and services tax. It came in a survey of Australians' attitudes through 4,000 letters to John Hewson. The report finds great anxiety about Australia's declining performance. Australians want strong leadership. Dr Hewson says he's prepared to meet the challenge with tough policies. Around, even if some of those are going to be difficult to explain and difficult to get people on side. But the mood is there, people are willing to do things differently. John Hewson is still coy much, on John. details, though today he all but ruled out a flat rate tax as part of his new package. Paul Bongiorno, 10 Eyewitness News. Well, the federal and state governments are planning a coalition to reduce the influence of environmentalists. At stake are major developments, multi-million dollar projects that don't get off the ground because of conservation disputes. Energy ministers from both sides of the political spectrum agreed on what they called a mechanism to counter environmental lobby objections to a wide range of developments. Issues from gold mining at Coronation Hill in the Kakadu National Park to logging of our native forests. It's about time uh, that government uh, listened uh, to that vast majority of Australian people who I think want governments to look at these issues closely on proper scientific grounds rather than em embracing rhetoric. The ministers say the organisation would be independent but with the power of enforcement, relying on scientific 
rather than emotive evidence. What we've got to recognise is that it cannot be only looked at from an environmental <coughs> perspective, it also has to be looked at from a production perspective. The energy ministers deny this is a greenie bashing exercise. The final form of their planned new arbitration rests with the special premier's conference in November. Out there there is an increasing realisation that Australia has resources and that there must be a mechanism put in place to enable us to, uh, to, to develop those resources. The energy ministers say it will be at least two months before a working party finalises details of their proposals. Paul Mullins, 10 Eyewitness News. Australia's major football codes have been rocked by a federal court ruling. The court has declared the New South Wales Rugby League's player draft illegal and it's a restraint of trade as well. Now Australian rules officials are looking at the effect the ruling will have on their own draft system. The Rugby League Players Union went to court arguing the clubs would draft players who didn't want to play with them. And during the season their worst fears were realised. Lawyers for the union insisted players would stay with clubs for less money to avoid the risk of it happening to them. And it wouldn't stop the mid-season discussion anyway. Wonderful uh, win for the players, for all players, but particularly for the rank and file average club player who hasn't got the bargaining clout of the stars. It's a great victory for them. The league says the draft is aimed at stopping poaching, creating loyalty and encouraging junior programs naturally disappointed but certainly not surprised. We did not hide from the fact that the draft was a restraint of trade. We've not done that from day one. I'm disappointed again that the courts have seen um, to interfere in sport. The federal court judge ruled that under the Trade Practices Act the draft was a restraint of trade on players and it ordered the rugby league to pay two-thirds of the players union's costs. The decision appears to threaten the Australian Rules Football League and its new national competition. But while the rugby system is based on the Aussie Rules one, officials say they have safeguarded the AFL. They allow the swapping of players and lessen restraint. We would hope that, it's, uh, that it isn't a restraint of trade. The Trade Practices Act, uh, again, it was uh, stated that that didn't apply. So that's three times in uh, court situations. That situation has been uh, uh, clarified. Stephen Claney, 10 Eyewitness News. Still to come, the world's biggest banking scandal, new charges and arrests. And Yugoslavia's latest fighting wearies even the peacemakers. The fate of the European Peace Conference on Yugoslavia is in grave doubt. It's actually scheduled to start tomorrow. But the question now being asked by Europe is, does such a conference stand any chance of success while battles rage between Serbs and Croats? Europe's special envoy to Croatia will today risk visits to more trouble spots in what so far proved a fruitless bid to establish a lasting ceasefire anywhere. His latest trip to Osijek in northeast Croatia came as 16 townspeople killed earlier this week were buried. But the new truce the EC envoy negotiated there was broken by heavy shelling within 15 minutes. Getting the Serb and Croat fighters to muzzle their guns before tomorrow's planned conference in The Hague looks to be mission impossible. In the south, there's a fierce battle for the town of Konstanitsa. And on the highway linking Zagreb with the Yugoslav capital Belgrade, new shelling by tanks and artillery started this morning. At least six serious casualties are reported and an ambulance ferrying the wounded came under fire. As the Croats steadily lose ground, their president, Franjo Tudjman, has been trying to boost morale, and he's pledged that his countrymen will fight to the last drop of blood. Not the sort of message to reassure a worried Europe, as it watches the mayhem and considers calling off its latest attempt to secure a negotiated peace. After months of legal wrangling, the cocaine conspiracy trial of former Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega is now underway. Jury selection for his Miami trial has begun and it will be one of the main stumbling blocks to the final verdict. Finding jurors who are unbiased will be difficult in the politically charged, heavily Hispanic atmosphere of Miami. Noriega faces dozens of drug trafficking and money laundering charges. 
Also in Miami, American prosecutors have filed new charges in the case of BCCI and the former treasurer of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International has been arrested in France. In all, seven people were charged with laundering drug money, including a reputed Colombian drug lord. Saeed Ali Akbar is the first character close to the centre of the collapsed Bank of Credit and Commerce International to be arrested. According to the accountant's report which led to the closure of the bank, he was in charge of money market operations which lost one billion dollars and then tried to conceal the truth. Mr Akbar has also been linked with General Manuel Noriega, the deposed Panamanian dictator. Today the High Court in London renewed a freeze on Mr Akbar's assets at the request of Panama's government which is trying to recover 23 million dollars it says was taken by General Noriega. As the criminal investigations gain pace, the underlying question on both sides of the Atlantic remains how BCCI was allowed to operate for so long. In Washington, a congressional report today criticized American authorities for failing to act sooner. It wasn't because the government didn't know. Law enforcement and files dating back as far as 1983 had details of BCCI shenanigans. Belatedly, the authorities on both sides of the Atlantic are closing in on BCCI. Investigators say further arrests are imminent. In business news, family courts are targeting the complex ownership structures of family businesses as they attempt to split assets after a divorce. The Business Review Weekly's Robert Gottliebson reports. These days, about 35% of marriages end up in divorce. What most people think about in a divorce is the fate of the children. But what about the fate of the family business or superannuation policy? Family businesses usually have a complex web of trusts and companies which control the cash. They're set up this way to minimise tax. When a divorce takes place, family courts are increasingly looking behind the veil of the complex ownership and making simple 50-50 splits between husband and wife. And while that sounds fair, it usually means that the business has to be sold. And right now is not a good time to sell a business. Not surprisingly, some families are using the legal rights conferred on them by the ownership structure to fight the family courts. Recently, a husband went to jail because he did not transfer shares in the family company to his wife as directed by the family court. He claimed he didn't have the power to transfer the assets because his children had control and they were refusing to sign the documents. The court didn't believe him, but the wife still hasn't got the assets. One of the assets held by many business professionals is superannuation entitlements. And the family court is now looking closely at transferring some of the superannuation to the former spouse. It seems the courts believe that nothing is sacred when it comes to splitting assets between husband and wife in a divorce settlement. To the stock market, and the all of his index rose slightly, even though John Kerrin warned that if inflation was rekindled, interest rates would rise again. The highlight of the day was a seven cent rise in TNT to 93 cents. Other stocks to move forward were National Australia Bank and CRA. The Australian dollar was firmer at 78.65 US cents, but in the final half hour's trading, some big buying orders appeared from Asia. So don't be surprised if it firms tonight in London and New York. This is Robert Gottlebson. Coming up, football finals fever and Jimbo pushes, punches and pranks his way closer to a US Open Championship. In sports news, it's a history-making weekend for Australian rules football. The first AFL final ever to be held outside Victoria is on Sunday at Perth Subiaco Oval. A cauldron of West Coast Eagles supporters will be wanting blood when Hawthorne arrive to take them on. The Eagles are minor premiers, but Hawthorne's no stranger to finals, and they will be tough. The winner of that match meets the winner of another Sunday game in Melbourne, the second elimination final between Geelong and St Kilda. Geelong's at full strength, but down St Kilda way, they're looking for grand final glory. And tomorrow, Essendon meets Melbourne in another cutthroat final. Bombers captain Timmy Watson admits they are the underdog, but their shocking defeat by Hawthorne last week might put some sting in their game. And in Rugby League, it's do or die for last year's Premiers Canberra and Manly tomorrow in their sudden death semi-final. Both teams have been hard hit by injuries to star players, while on Sunday it's straight into the grand final for the winner of the Penrith North Sydney game. Minor Premiers Penrith have been stung by their loss in the grand final last year, but the Bears also can smell Premiership success after 69 years. 
In tennis, Jimmy Connors is a US Open semi-finalist again at 39. He's cavorted and crunched his way past Dutchman Paul Harhus in the quarter-finals. But he'll need to be at his youthful best against French Open winner Jim Courier, who de defeated defending champ Pete Sampras. Another not-so-young competitor, Ivan Lendl, crept into the semis with a win over Michael Stick, and he'll play Stefan Edberg. But the flushing Meadow fanatics only had eyes and voice for Jimbo. Poor old Paul Harhus. He dared play on Connor's court in Connor's show before Connor's 20,000 fans. Almost an indictable offence in New York. Despite that, he led the first set 5-1 before Connor's found a groove back to 4-5. Harhus took the set but was made to feel like he stole it. Oh, the volley long and the set to Harhus. Connors had begun to inspire his contemporaries, Arthur Ashe, John guest commentator Ashe, John McEnroe, player, and ever the showman player. started to fire. Down a break in the second set, he grafted back to take it in a tie break, and this was the point that turned the match upside down. His racket, a sledgehammer, slowly pounding Harhus into the pavement. As Connors took control of the third set, he chatted with fans, played the court jester. Oh, 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 we saw that on the replay. <laughs> and by now his trademark comments to the commentator. Oh, that was a close one, Venus. <laughs> he also used a wayward moth and an argument in the stands to Good slow the pace down, before down. taking the set 6-4. All of that was on a triple set point. The amphitheatre beamed as Connors broke Harhus twice to tie up the fourth set 5-2. Next, the weekend outlook with Ray Wilkie and the dustbin of history is a garden in Moscow. And now here's Ray Wilkie with the weather. Thank you, Anne. Good night, everyone. Great to be Friday again, isn't it, eh? <laughs> well, not much doing except hot, 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 right over the whole of this uh, Commonwealth. Have a look. See some of these temperatures up here. Look at this. Although, mind you, I do tell a lie. Melbourne wasn't too bad. 17 today, but that's about the only capital that wasn't dried up because they had fog down there and it held on all morning. There must have been a bit of a pea super. And over the bay, too, it held on, too, till about mid-afternoon before it broke up. But except for Melbourne temperature, look at these, 27, eh, at Adelaide. Kansas only 27. Very hot all the way through here with temperatures well in, over the inland into the middle 30 degrees. There was some shower activity, or was I should say, from about Carnarvon down the west coast around to Albany and a few storms we can see the hatching over South Australia where there's a bit of a trough moving that way. Otherwise it's been pretty well fine, a few spots of course on the western coast of Tassie. Let's have a look at these clouds. There they are, that uh, line of clouds here has a few showers, a few, one, two, three perhaps, uh, and thunderstorms mixed up with them. And that line of cloud, as you know, has come from this way since the last couple of days. There's the cloud that produced a few showers on the western coast. There's a the cold front moving through, but otherwise not much doing anywhere. So we'll have a look at the chart. And it's the same old chart, dear, dear, dear. I hope next week we can get a new one for you. Pile of air, likes New South Wales, not moving much. About the same pressure, 2024. The upper air has the dry conditions circulating, although, as I said last night, a little moisture sneaking in from the Indian Ocean here in the high levels. Enough which on lifting from this low pressure area has produced that little bit of cloud we saw over this area here. A little bit of surface moisture coming in here in the far north coast of Queensland and a few showers around the Cairns area. Otherwise, pretty well dry and hot. Ahead of this change, this little bit of moisture that has been coming in again from the Indian Ocean has been lifted and produced a few showers. Tomorrow you'll find everything moving eastwards for a change. So the highs at last looks like it's going to get into the Tasman Sea. Not that it'll make much difference except perhaps even hotter conditions over the southeastern states as these wind pull more from the north to the northwest with time. There'll be a few showers in the far north coast and as this trough here moves eastwards too, there'll be a scattering of showers and storms moving through from perhaps from central Australia, may pick up a few on the western border of Queensland, western New South Wales, getting through south Australia and into western New South Wales in the next 24 hours. Not a lot of rain with it, but just enough to say, well, we've had some. There it is. Let's see the map and you'll be able to see where we expect these showers to be and a few thunderstorms. There it is. Just a few showers in Perth, but the thunderstorm activity down here with that change and a little bit of shower and storm activity here. Pretty patchy, mind you. Temperatures tomorrow still be right up, except Perth. 
going to drop down to 18. Big temperature difference between 18 there and 28 in Adelaide due to the cooler air coming through. There it is. The weekend looks like very good conditions coming up. Hope you enjoy it. I'll be back on Monday with you. Good night. Thank you, Ray. Well, it's been three weeks since the Soviet Union coup attempt, and when it happened, fears of a shift back to the days of the Cold War were very real. Instead, the putsch proved literally a graveyard for hardliners present and past. Here lies Felix Dzerzhinsky, the Polish nobleman who founded the first Soviet secret police, toppled from his pedestal in front of KGB headquarters. A small debate here, is this Nikita Khrushchev? the premier who told the West, we'll bury you. Without his wart, it's hard to be sure. A new perspective on Joseph Stalin, looking most uncomfortable. In the jackboots and Elvis do, Yakov Sverdlov, who had a hand in the murder of the last Russian czar. Vyacheslav Molotov, the man who gave his name to the cocktail. Vladimir Lenin doesn't answer up to the roll call here, but there are some who expect him to join this pantheon of has-beens any day. Titans all, now cut down to size, feared no more, no longer able to hide their discomfiture, and at risk of even worse indignities. They shouldn't be left like this. The statues didn't do any harm. Most people we talked to spoke of historic value, not of art. They may not know much about art as they don't know much about democracy, but they know what they don't like. And that's the second edition news. Have a good weekend. I'm Anne Fullwood. Good night. The 10 Second Edition News, brought to you by Mobile.